So at the, at the beginning of the week, I, oh no, it wasn't the beginning of the week, the end of the week, Friday morning, I said to Marty, who's waiting to, to print the newsletter, he's waiting, he always waits, what, what's the passage and the, and the, and the sort of the, um, the title of the message and so on. So I gave, oh, I think it'll be, Eph- it'll be Ephesians chapter four. And normally I'm, I'm you know, pretty, pretty organized. Um, but, uh, but so if you open up the newsletter, you'll see there's Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 to 16. And I, I'm just saying, I'm not even going to speak on this, actually. Um, but everything that I say will be about this. And yet, um, this is how Christ gave himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors and teachers, and, and so on, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we or reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, becoming mature and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That, that is what I'm talking about. And it says, Then will we no longer infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by the every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That is the picture that is going to be behind everything that I share, even if I don't specifically refer to that as we go on. It's a beautiful picture and it's about us. So on Thursday, I had the privilege of taking my turn to lead the weekly chapel service at Mountain View Village. And it was lovely to see you there, Stella. Um, And there were others there too, thank goodness. Um, On Pages Road there, where I decided to share um, from these beautiful words right here in Matthew chapter 22, where Jesus describes the greatest commandment of them all, right? which is to, as he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And he says, and he brings in this as well, it is to love your neighbor as yourself. That's bringing together um, passage in Deuteronomy, the numbers just gone out of my brain, and Leviticus chapter 19. And if you read both, it's amazing to see the context of those two Um, verses there, especially um, the one Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself to explore what a neighbor is. But then I thought, well, that's also a great place for me to sort of intro our theme today as we continue in this journey of exploring how we grow. So, so far in this series, we've explored lots of really important ingredients in God's recipe for how we grow. Like last week, we explored um, how the Bible is one of the greatest gifts and tools that God has given us to help us grow and to walk in God's ways. And, you know, we've explored how suffering and trials are a great catalyst to our growth as well. And we've explored other themes beyond that too. And yet today, what I want to do is I want to start... As I, wanna, as I want to, to I wanna look at how vital and how important it is for us all, if we truly want to follow Jesus and to grow to be more like Him, I want to look at how important and vital it is that we are each deeply embedded and involved in an honest, deep, and loving community of faith. Okay? which is how I make the connection with these verses here on the screen. Now, for me, it's interesting to note at this point that the whole idea of our growth and our discipleship to Jesus is not just like another kind of hobby or an optional routine that I can just, I can sort of choose to squeeze into my already busy week, Um, a sort of personalized self-help tool that will improve my mind or my body or my soul. But instead to follow Jesus, it takes all of who we are and 
it's not something that we can do just on our own. And so I want to ask you as we start, what is a disciple of Jesus Christ? And you kids, you're going to be really helpful, trust me, on this too. What is a disciple of Jesus Christ? And what's involved in our discipleship to Jesus Christ? And this is where I was thinking about you kids, and most of you kids not even, not even listening, eh? Because you don't even think that it's going to involve you. But it does, okay? So what is a disciple of Jesus? Come on, tell me. What is a disciple of Jesus Christ? What is involved? Well, I was thinking about you kids, who are not listening over there, who are about to go back to school tomorrow, where you have to use your... Um, your taringas, because as students, do you know that you are a lot like disciples too? You're a lot like disciples. But for anyone who is a disciple of Jesus, it's this community of faith that is our classroom. Hey, this is this is the classroom. And, and whatever our age, we are students in this classroom here with each other. And, we, and we're students in this classroom, not just for five or six or 12, 13 years, which is the number of years that you probably go to school. But we're students in this classroom for life. And we're all students like this together. Now, if you are a teacher as some of you here I know are. If you're a teacher, then of course, you'll do a whole lot of thinking and a whole lot of talking, believe it, believe me, I know, about how students learn. Pedagogy. How do students learn? And ironically, one of the best ways that people learn is not from just listening to one guy standing up here up the front and talking. That is not a good way for us to learn. And so I know that often in a classroom, at school, a younger child will be paired with an older child um, who is a little bit further on, right? That's a good idea. Um, and there's lots of time and space to share in different ways across the class, not just the teacher from up the front. And then as well, I know that just like kids, we also benefit and we grow from having um, other kids around us who have different strengths and needs to ourselves, right? Because even while, as we're told by some of the politicians, we need to return back to the basics at school. Um, school should never just be about the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic, reading, writing, and maths, but it's, it's about learning lots of other really important skills as well, hey, like how do we get along with people who are different from ourselves? How do we learn to listen and to communicate well with others? How do we learn to show tolerance and grace and respect and, and how to share all of these kinds of things we learn with others and we learn at school. Now, for you kids, you're off to school, many of you tomorrow. Is there anything like what school is like for you? Is it? Did you hear a word of what I said? <laughs> well, I think it probably is. And so, so I want to ask then, what do you think it was like in the time of Jesus? What do you think it was like in the time of Jesus to be a student in those days too? What do you think it was like for Jesus' first group of disciples who would have walked with him back then? What we know, I think, is, they, is that they were invited by Jesus from some really different walks of life to form a very tight community of relationships, both with Jesus and with each other too. And during this time, yes, 
they would have soaked up every single word that Jesus said. And they would have watched and tried to do just about everything that Jesus did, I'm sure. But (laughs) I'm also quite sure that they would have learned a lot, an incredible amount from each other too. I mean, even if it was just by seeing, oh, wow, dumb Peter, that was a really dumb thing that you just said or did. That was a really dumb question that you just asked, James. Or then as well, what about the ways that they would have each been challenged and inspired by each other too? You know, like in lots of wonderful ways as well. Um, you know, I, th- I, think of, I think of Mary in that moment when she, she breaks that jar of naan and she worships with tears at Jesus' feet. Wow. Is that worship? Is that what it means to worship? Or, or I think of when they all came back and told their stories from those missionary trips when they were sent away. How much they would have learned from the community um, that they had with each other. Now imagine if your school or our church was like that. And then finally it comes to this moment when Jesus turns to his students. Hey, do you remember this? And he tells them to go into all the world and to make many other students and disciples like this too. And he tells them to go and to invite others so that they too will come and join in the, in the fun as well. Join, come into the classroom with us as well. And so, so here we are today, if you're following along with me so far. Here we are today. And I'm, and I'm thinking about these words of Matthew chapter 28. And as I've been thinking about these words throughout the week, I guess one of the things that has come clear for me that I haven't so much seen before is is the real community kind of picture that this suggests. Can you see? But then another interesting thing that I've realized is that even in the message of the gospel, even in the message of the gospel, which which is what all of this is about, it's a, it's a very community kind of thing as well. And I want to make this point with just a few thoughts, in fact, about sin. Okay, so the gospel and sin. The gospel gives us freedom and redemption from sin. So I want to ask you for a moment, and, and here's a chance to share. What is sin? Here's a chance to share, just to quickly talk with someone near. What is sin? Can you, can you share just the first thing that comes to you right now? What is sin? What is sin? How do you define sin? I don't think this microphone is on um, you too, but do you want to share? We'll just try and see if do you want to share what you have in mind. Um, oh, yeah, it is on. When we turn away from God. Yeah. I think that's a good answer. When we turn away from God. And when you do lots of bad things. When we turn away from God and do lots of bad things. Yeah. Good job. I totally agree. And Jesus saves us from our sins. Saves us from our sin. 
It's who brings us back to God. Hey. And even in that, it's a, it's a very relational kind of thing. And for me, what I, what I want to say is that sin is, yes, it is that, is the turning away from God and doing really bad things. But it's, it is also, it, it's in that turning away from God, it's the breaking and the spoiling of not just that relationship with God, but it's the, it's the spoiling and the breaking of, of, our, of, the, of the sort of the four greatest relationships that we've been made by God to have. And, and that apart from our just DNA, are the, are the most basic and foundational parts of, of who we are. And, and, and we, see, we see how this plays out in the fall. Even there, it is a, is a relational kind of thing. So if you're with me, then what, what do you think are the four greatest relationships that we've been beautifully designed by God to have? Well, one, you guessed it, it is a broken relationship with God. But then two, it's a broken relationship with others. But then also three, it equates to a broken relationship with ourselves. When we turn away from God, we actually turn away from ourselves and who God has made us to be. Did you know that, Asha? Yeah. And then lastly, sin equals a broken relationship with creation, with the rest of what God has created too. And you even see this. If, you, if you're someone who's going to go and look up Leviticus chapter 19 and, and the love of others as you love yourself. It's, it's all there explained, the purpose of the law. So what does the Bible have to say about sin? Well, it says and it shows that in so many different ways, the most basic problem of the human race is that we are trying to live outside of God's design because of our broken relationships with God and our broken relationships with all of these others too. Just look at Genesis chapter 3 and chapter 4, how this played out for the first family that ever lived. Hey. And so that is sin. And then now I want to ask, as we fast forward from the fall, Genesis 3 and 4, to, to Matthew chapter 4, okay, the start of Jesus' ministry. What is the first thing that Jesus did after he began to preach about the kingdom of God or the, the kingdom of heaven? When he, when he said that the kingdom of heaven had come near, what is the very first thing that Jesus did next? Well, he, he begins to call a small group of students, a small group of students or disciples friends into into a new radical community with himself and he starts to show them what it means to do what to do what well in effect he, he starts to teach them and to show them what it means how to fulfill the law of God how how to love the Lord our God with all our hearts and all our souls and all our minds and all our strength and and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. He shows how we fulfill the law of God. And he rescues us from our sin, which is a broken relationship with all these things. And then what he does is he asks them all to go and do the same, which is what we heard before. To go into all the world and to announce to others that you can be part of this too. This kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven has come. Yes, we're forgiven from our sin. But this is what it looks like to be involved, to be part of this new thing. It's a radical, real, and deep community of faith that's both experiencing and living out in real time today the, the healing and the mending of these four greatest things that we've been made by God to have as the foundation of who we are. A relationship with God, a relationship with others, a healthy relationship with ourselves and with the planet that God has made. 
And so I want to ask today, I want to ask as, as a church, and as the body of Christ, and, and I want to ask as someone myself who is looking and praying for a way to experience this myself, and how to help us as a community to, to grow in these ways, I want to ask then, what might this look like for us today? To be a community in this city right here that both proclaims and that proves that Jesus has come. That the kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of heaven has come and is here. Can you help? Lately, I've been reading about how Jesus called his 12 disciples from the crowds who were drawn to Jesus too. The crowds were drawn to Jesus too. And while the crowds would have no doubt followed and learned from Jesus as well, with a group about the size of 12, let's say, you know, there's just a lot more time and space and intimacy and trust to be able to go deep, you know, and to invest in people's lives, to know and to be known by one another. But then, as, and as many of us will know, as time went on, what, what did Jesus do as well? Well, what he did was that from that original group of 12, Jesus also, in the end, chose three um, who spent much deeper and even more intimate time with Jesus too. Now, if you're a parent, or if you're a child, or if you've ever been a child, then you will no doubt know the value and the power and the impact that some decent one-on-one -on -one time can have. Like with your parent or with your child. Or, or with someone who is like that to you as well. And, and, and if you, and if you f don't know what it is like, maybe because you feel like you missed out, then you will know the power of it because you will feel that you've missed out. But in the end, in terms of a strategy that Jesus used, then I'm, I'm sure that even you kids will, will know um, and, and you can see how this worked out. You can see why this is wise. It really was a community kind of thing. Which is partly, yes, how Jesus trained and equipped his disciples. It was his pedagogy to, to help equip them to go into the world. But then it was also, as I shared before, a way of showing and improving and sharing the experience of this radical new life that Jesus brings. This is how we f live it and feel it, in fact, ourselves. And so I wonder, to what extent do you think we embrace Jesus' own strategy and game plan here today? <coughs> or, <coughs> where we don't, what do you think could be standing in the way? And I would love to know what would happen if we did. Wouldn't you love to know what would happen if we did? Well, if you are here today, and if you join us most weeks, then let's say that you're at least part of the crowd. Okay? This is like the crowd. And I should say, that is a much better place to be than not part of the crowd at all. And by the way, I'm not forgetting you who are at home, who can't physically be present with us here yourself. And if that's you, we miss you. Um, and we care. And please let us know if, if, if we're not coming around enough to say hello and to spend time with you where you are.
a lot can happen in the crowd. Hey, a lot of things can happen in the crowd, and the crowd is good. And maybe it's no less important than the 12 or than the 3. Because it's here where at least we should get to hear and, about and be inspired and encouraged by each other's faith. To hear the stories and the testimonies of people's faith. There's worship. There's the preaching of God's Word. There's a chance to minister to and to be ministered to by the use of each other's gifts. There's Ephesians chapter 4. And there's the Great Commission, which we heard about before, and how important it is that we're working in that together as a team. And be warned, and for the record, as a church, we need to increase our focus on that as well. And yet attendance, like in a context like this, does not automatically translate to growth and to maturity in our faith. I mean, let's be honest, there are some people who just come to analyze or evaluate or to judge the music or or what the person from the front has to say. There's some people who just come to judge. Or there are others who just come to receive what is an offer as knowledge. That's not growth. That's just knowledge. But what is fact is that our growth as followers of Jesus is a much more hands-on and involved in a much more community kind of thing. It's a community kind of thing. And as we grow, the idea is that we then in, and increasingly will start to reach out and to help and encourage others too. It's a community kind of thing. But then what about the 12? Would you know that as far as I'm aware, only 15% of us are currently involved in a group like this, that, that regularly meets to go deep and to encourage one another in the applying of God's word to our lives. Only about 15% of our church is in that space. And and, and we should know that if it was important for those who actually got to sit face to face with Jesus, then boy, it should be important to us too. You know, this is as simple as making a commitment to meet with a group of, say, five or six or, yeah, even up to 12 people in someone's home, maybe in the middle of the week. Or or we have groups who meet here at the church or, or in a cafe wherever it might be. Now, in some ways, many or even most of the things that we do today are a part of what we do in a small group like this as well. But the big thing that is different is that you can go deep. And you can, you can know one another and be known in a much deeper kind of way. There's much more space for discussion. Let me just give you four minutes to discuss with someone near you who, you who you might not even know. There's much more space for discussion and for going deep. It's like a, it can be like a tailor-made approach to each person in the room. Tailor-made to suit how each person needs to grow. And the fact is that if any of us are to grow in a really deep in really deep and important ways, then we need the space to be vulnerable and open and real around others who we can feel safe, with whom we can feel safe, and who will embrace us and accept us as we are. Who, and who will know us enough to be to just sort of sensitively encourage and support us to grow. Pastoral care Building a culture of welcome where no one falls through the cracks. These sort of things as well. And then finally, of course, if you're counting, there's the three. There's there's what um, Charles John Wesley called the core or the three. 
Maybe at a push, you could squeeze in four or five. Um, but the point is that at this kind of level, or, or in a group like this, that there's just maximum depth of openness and trust. You know these people have got your back. Now, from the Bible, we've already heard about Jesus. But then later, this is also what Paul and the other disciples did as well. You know, many of us have heard about the way that Paul invested his life in Timothy. Titus was one as well. Or, or in one of Paul's letters to the church, he encourages us, them and, and us all to join together in following his example just as you have us, as, and just as you have us as a model. He says, keep your eyes who, on those who live like us. He invested deeply into people's lives. I mentioned the Wesleys. They also formed a community like this too. Um, I think early 1700s, something like that. And to give you a sense of the, of the depth of the groups that met in people's homes, in the, in the groups of two or three, each week when they would meet, do you know what the questions that they would ask? Do you know the topic of their discussion? Be warned, it's not light and fluffy like many of our conversations that we have today. They would ask each other every single week, what known sins have you committed since we last met? And I, they would ask these in love. What known sins have you committed since we last met in this last week? What temptations have you had and how were you delivered? What have you thought, said, or done about which you're not sure if it's even sin? And then lastly, I like this, have you nothing you desire to keep secret? Can you imagine a community or a classroom that is like that? Now, is there anyone here at all who... Who you, with whom you regularly meet and can honestly and openly talk like that. This is Jesus' strategy for us to grow. It's a community kind of thing. And I have to, but I have to confess that I, I, I have not had very much practice at this myself. And, and I need some help. You know, I've had some tastes. I've had some tastes of this kind of thing. But all it's left me with is the feeling that I know and I, that I need and that I want more. You know, so f for example, I've mentioned to a few of you, I've had this, this leadership course that I've been on. Um, and, and, and with a cohort of leaders, other leaders from around the country over the past two years, it featured four week-long residentials. There was, this, there was the whole group, say around about 30. Then we had smaller groups of six. It's consistent the same the whole time through. But then we also had one partner who we would meet with regularly to go even deeper in prayer and encouragement as well. And my, did we all go deep? People who... Just over two years ago, we did not even know from a bar of soap. My, did we go deep. And did we grow? Yes, we did. And so how do we compare this to today? I think in general, we are poor. I think we're very much lacking in these kinds of things. If you disagree, I'd love you to come and share. Come and let me know. I'd love to know. Um, let me know about the wonderful depth of community that you are having and how that is helping you to grow. But then in terms of what are the things that are standing in the way? It's a pretty individualistic world that we live in here today. Hey. And, I, and I think that shapes like pretty much everything that we do. It's good to be aware. 
I guess in closing, I want to suggest that today, if any of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ are only engaged with the body of Christ at this level here, or even if the way that we engage at this level is, is just a bit superficial and light, I want to say that I really do believe that Jesus is truly inviting us into more. That Jesus is inviting you into more. The other week, when a few of us went and heard from the principal of Cary Baptist College, John Tucker, who also spoke here on Sunday, on the Saturday, however, we were inspired by to hear about our early Baptist roots that are based on this radical idea of community too. This is the type of covenant that they made together as a church. And I can't help but think and dream about how powerful and attractive this could be for others beyond ourselves as we seek to share the good news in this lonely and individualistic world that we live in here today. To be part of a community that is like that. And if you consider yourself to be a disciple, and if you care about the mission of the church, then if you hear nothing else from me today, then hear this. It is in the context of deep relationships with others. And I want to emphasize that word, deep. It's a context of deep relationships with others who are disciples of Jesus too, where true, deep discipleship and growth takes place. And if you're not in that kind of place yourself, then let's talk. And from there, as has been seen time and time again, the gospel and the church flourish and grow. That is the heart. That is my prayer. That we would grow. And that we would grow in these ways. It's a community kind of thing. So let's close with this. What one step could you take over the next few days and weeks to invest more deeply in our community of faith? How can you use your gifts? Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. You can look that up as well. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. How can we grow in the way we talk? By asking or inviting others or by modeling ourselves how to share more vulnerably and deeply about where we're at in our faith. Maybe what we're doing or could do at the moment that either is or that might help us all to grow, that might be helping you to grow. There's a few challenges there for us today. Let's pray. God, you have made us to follow you and to become more like you as we follow you with others too. And so we pray that as a church that you would do your work in us, that you would break us, Lord, down, break down that individualistic bent. As people prayed before during our time of worship, Lord, we earnestly seek Revival in this church to be brought back to life. Dead bones made to live. Lord, it's a community kind of thing. Help us, Lord, to come back to you. And as we do, Lord, bring us back to each other to heal the broken relationships that, is, that are our sin. Lord, let each person leave today feeling challenged and encouraged and equipped by your spirit to move on in this way. In Jesus' name we pray and for the glory of your name and of your church we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like someone to pray with afterwards, if you'd like to talk about community, being more involved, come and talk. Carol, do you want to lead us in a final song? Don't forget... Um, 
Genevieve's going to be sharing her awesome speech at the front. <laughs> if you want to go out to the toilet and then come back afterwards, you're welcome to do that. <laughs>